So I'm going to start out with graphing the region. And when I catch up to where you are, then you should probably pay attention. So you are in different places. <clears throat> right now, it's solving this problem. So we have to rotate our region about the y-axis. Oh. So I'm just redrawing two copies, and then the rotation. So you should get a shape that looks kind of like this. You might be a much better artist, so your shape might look a lot better, or might look a lot worse. But the important part is our cross section. So I need to go parallel to my axis. I'm going to draw it on the right side because that will come back to my original one really nicely. If I drew it on the left, I'd have to do a mirror image one on the right. And the shape that the cross section rotates into better be a cylinder, and it looks like this. So I need the height and the radius. So I'll trace that back to the original. So this is the height, and I also need a radius. So any questions on the measurements on the cylinder that, that revolved into or tracing it back up to the original? So it's important you draw these out so that you can see exactly where the measurements are. Um, I'm having difficulty finding my radius. So are you okay with the picture I drew yeah. right here? Yes. All right. So how do we squeegee the window? So I. It's a little bit tricky because it looks like there's two squeegees, but there's really only one squeegee. So a squeegee is that vertical. It's our actual cross section, not the measurement to the radius, or not the uh, radius measurement. So we need to change our x coordinates. So this is a dx integral. So we need uh, everything as functions of x. So let's think, let's do the height first. So the height is going to be big minus small. They're all big minus small. What is the big function for height? I didn't label my region. So our big function is squared x. It's already a function of x. That's nice. What is small? Zero. Yep, so we could write the y equals zero if you want to. That's the x-axis right there. So it's going to be minus 0, and that's just square root x. So that's our height. What about our radius? So radius is going to be x. This is the implicit one that's a little bit tricky to see. So the way I think about it, your x is going to go between 0 and 4. So the smallest x is going to be a 0, biggest is 4 as you clean your window. And whatever your current x coordinate is, that's your radius right there. So your radius always be between 0 and 4, and it's whatever x is. I don't have to add anything or subtract anything because I'm going right around the y-axis. So x is our distance from the y-axis. So our r of x is x. And that's a little tricky because it's implicit. It's not one of the given functions. So that one can seem a little bit more tricky to find. 
And that's pretty much uh, all we need. We just need the two bounds for integral. So volume equals. I'm going to use the first version, the general version right here, because it works whichever way you go. So I recommend this one goes on your cheat sheet, but you can put either one. You'll just have more space if you use the general one. <clears throat> so we have our 2 pi integral. R is x, h square root x, dx, and I didn't spend any time computing the intersects, intercepts of the uh, intersection of the different functions, but this one was pretty easy, so I'm going to just skip computing that. So we got 0 and 4. Make sure you use x values, don't use y values. We got a dx integral, so you got to talk about the, y, the x values to clean your window. Tiny bit of algebra here. We have x to the first times x to the half, x to the 3 halves power dx. How do you find the antiderivative? So anti-power rule. Add 1 to the power, or add 2 halves to the power, divide by the new power. Guess and check can be really useful. So I'm going to just say dot, dot, dot. So this integral is pretty straightforward to compute. Yeah, okay, definitely. Show us one of those examples. Yeah, let's do one more example. So I have a second. Let's take the same region. So the y equals square root x, y equals 0, and x equals 4. Now we better change what we rotate about. And let's rotate about the line y equals negative 2. So you can redraw your region, but now your rotation axis is horizontal, and it's also not the x-axis. It's negative 2, so 2 below the x-axis. It'll be a little bit strange. I like to draw my rotation axis dotted instead of solid. It's up to you how you want to draw it. But I don't want to confuse it with the x-axis. So I don't want to draw it solid. How do my cross sections go in my solid? Horizontal. They go horizontal. So they're parallel with our rotation axis. So I'll draw one cross section in blue. And now I'm going to redraw what the cross section revolves into. cylinder. It's a little strange. Our height is now sideways. That's the reason that I recommend you draw your cylinder. So your height is sideways here, not a vertical height. And what actually is measured as the vertical measurement is the radius. So that's a little bit strange. It's obvious when you see your cylinder, less obvious if you come back to the original. So I'm going to trace the height and the radius back. 
So that's H. This one is R. So any questions bringing those measurements back to our original region? So do we have a dx or dy integral? dy. dy. So you got a squeegee or windshield changing your y coordinate. So we have a dy integral. So all of our functions need to be y. So do your best to find h of y and r of y. The h of y should probably be a little bit easier. And they're both big minus small. So what is the big height uh, cutoff, or the big height function? Four. So that'll be 4. It's a little strange, it's on the right side because you're picking the big x. So big x is always on the right. What about the small? So if I label this y equals square root x, why can't I just go minus square root x? Because it also has the y equals. Yeah, I need a function of y, yeah. not a function of x. So we need to turn this around. So I'm going to solve for x by squaring both sides. So y squared equals x. And now I can say the big x value cutoff is y squared, or the small cutoff is y squared. So I got my function of y now. So that one was a little tricky. You have to solve for your other variable. Any questions about that second, the small cutoff for the height? Now we're ready for the radius. <clears throat> the small is probably easier to see for the radius. So there's big up there, small down there. What is small? Negative 2. So it's going to be something minus the negative 2. So it can't be x, so I need functions of y. So that it'll be y. Why will it be y? Because if you look, your y goes from 0 to 2 overall. And whatever y value you're currently using, that's how far away from the x-axis you are. And then we had to do basically that additional plus 2 counted the extra amount that we also get. Now it looked like a minus a negative 2, but algebraically it turns into y plus 2. So whatever your y value is, 2 more than that is the actual radius you'll use when you revolve. So did this help out with your question? Yes. So you just have to look at your radius and then decide how, uh, how far you're going. And it's not always the measurement to the axis. Sometimes you have to go further in this case, or sometimes you actually go less. So at the end, y integral, mm -hmm. dy integral, so we got be 2 pi a to b r h. So they all start out like that. Okay. And now we just have to fill in, and we got h, we got an r, and a and b are right there on the graph, 0 to 2. So we got 0 to 2, r is y plus 2, h is 4 minus y squared. Now. This looks absolutely miserable if you leave it like this. Make sure you use parentheses. Or you're gonna, I don't even know what y plus 24 minus y squared. That's not at all what we want. So make sure you use parentheses so you know what is multiplied. Then factor and solve. Uh, I'd probably just, yeah, distribute and solve would be the way to go. So you got a third degree polynomial when you multiply it all out and anti-power rule. What's the difference between distribute and factor? Uh, they're inverse operations. Okay. So distribute is multiply, okay. and factor is unmultiply, okay. or factor, or separate out. So 
So this one we will leave here. So our next section is arc length. The good news is once we get the formula for it, it's actually a very easy computation. And the formula is not terribly bad. So we'll start out with something really similar, a curve going from A to B. I made sure I put some extra curvature into this curve. So I didn't want to draw a curve that didn't bend a lot. So I made sure this curve bent a lot. Because what I want to do to compute the length, so what we did before, if I wanted the area under the curve, so you don't need to draw anything I'm drawing right now. So I'll do all this in red and I'll undo it all. How do we get the area? We broke it into pieces and then added up the different areas of these pieces right here. So we're going to do something really similar for the length. We're going to break it into pieces, but we're going after the length. So the way we're going to break it up, so we subdivide in a similar way, except our subdivisions that we want to use are the line segments. We're not looking for the area, so we want to get into the length. So we're going to add up the length of these segments that we just drew right here. And of course, that's an estimate. How do we find the actual length? We take a limit as the number of line segments goes to infinity. So all we need to do now is figure out what's the length of one of these line segments. So we'll call this xk, xk plus 1. I only broke it into four pieces. That's not a very good estimate. But if you break it into n pieces, I'm just taking two adjacent x values right here. So how in the world do we get the length of this? So let's just draw the segment right here. I'll redraw this segment. And we have our first. Let's draw some measurements here. So I'm going to call that delta yk and delta xk. That's how much x changed and how much y changed. So those are the two measurements right there. How do we get the, so we'll call this lk. How is lk related to the other two sides? Square root the Pythagorean theorem. Pythagorean theorem. So that's a right triangle. So we're going to just relate them lk equals I don't have to worry about plus minus because I want to count the length and I'm not going to uh, have any segment be a negative length. So we got delta y k squared plus delta x k squared. So from here, we are going to relate. So let's look at slope. I don't know why I'm still writing in green. Let's switch back. Slope. So we have delta yk. So this slope is also known as f prime of xk. So it's not exactly the slope, but uh, now why do I say it's not exactly the slope? If I use this formula right here, the slope I'm actually finding is not the green slope, but it will be the slope, the tangent line at xk right there. So it'll actually be that slope. The good news is if I cut this into smaller and smaller pieces, that slope that I drew gets very close to. So if I cut this into way smaller pieces, my piece might only be that long. 
And if I cut into smaller pieces, the slope gets closer and closer. So there is a little inaccuracy, but once you take your limit, that will go away. So we're going to do a little bit of algebra here. Delta yk equals f prime of xk times delta xk. And I'm going to make this substitution in our LK up here. So delta YK, I'm going to write that as F prime XK times delta XK squared plus delta XK squared. So now both terms have a delta XK squared in them. So I'm going to factor that delta xk squared out. And we can bring the delta xk out of the square root. like that. And the algebra I did on that first step, it was AB squared plus B squared equals A squared plus 1B squared. So that was the algebra I did right there. I still want to keep writing all that prime subscripts and all that fun stuff. So I skipped a few algebra steps, but that's all I did. So this is the length of one segment. So all I have to do now is add up the lengths of all the segments. So our total length, so we'll use a regular L for this. So if I add up 0 to n, all these little LKs, I'll get the approximate length And we take the limit, this turns into an integral from A to B, f prime of x squared plus 1 dx. There are other ways to write this. We know f prime of x is dy dx. So if I make this substitution, actually before I do that, there's another way. If, if you have a function of y instead of a function of x, you can switch this around. g prime of y. plus 1 dy. And the second one, uh, if you started with a function of y, you can use the second one. And the first one is when y is a function of x. So depending on which way you start. <coughs> and on the second one, you can 
write g prime of y. It's a little bit strange, but g prime of y, that is dx over dy. So let's go ahead and do some examples. So most of these problems, you won't have to graph. You don't have to find intersections. I tell you x starts here, x stops here. And I give you a function of x. So we got our curve. We know our minimum, maximum, max value. All you have to do is just plug it into the formula here. So what we need is to find the derivative of y, or dy dx, and then plug it into the first formula. We got a function of x. And if you want to call this f of x, totally fine. And then you'll be finding f prime of x. So whatever of those two notations you like better, use that one. So if you like function notation or just the y equals notation. So find derivative, square it, and then plug it in. And do this right now. And just to warn you, that coefficient in front of x to the 3 halves power is there very specifically on purpose. It will allow you to factor it out nicely once you plug it all in. So once you find f prime, let's try to simplify f prime squared plus 1. And I'll give you a hint. That's the factoring. That's how it will factor.
at the a squared plus 2ab plus b squared, did you guys get a 9x squared plus 4x to the 3 halves square root of 2? Is that correct, F prime? Yeah. All right, so now I'm going to square that and add 1 to it. So we have 2 square root of 2, x, 1 half squared plus 1. So 2 squared is 4 times 2 is 8. Oh, that doesn't work out nicely at all. Oh. I'm thinking about the next problem that was going to use this. So, all right, we simplified it. Good. That was a little too easy. <laughs> Integral. So, 0 to 1, we got that right at the beginning. That was our x value, so there's nothing to do for, uh, nothing special to do for that. And it's square root. I'm just going to copy down this f prime squared plus 1. I recommend you do that separately because you're probably going to have to do a little bit of algebra. So, if you, if you write it unsimplified right here, you're going to have to do all your simplification while rewriting integral 0, 1, dx, integral 0, 1, dx, integral 0, 1, dx. So I recommend do that separately and plug that in. So how do we integrate this? Yep, u sub. What does u equal? 8x plus 1 du is 8 dx. We don't have an 8, so we'll take that to the other side as an eighth. So it's just going to turn into a square root of u antiderivative. So add one to the power, and you'll be able to figure that one out. Oh, it was the next example that I was thinking about. <coughs> Now you've probably found out already that Wolfram will answer your definite and integrals. It's very hard to type in sometimes. Oh really? Yeah. Uh, yeah, you do have to use certain notation with your endpoints and to tell it that you want the anti you know to integrate and all that. So it can be a little tricky. But I think if you look on Wolfram, uh, the website, there should be like examples you can you can look at pretty easily. If I remember correctly, what you do is just type in your, say, an x integral, then right at the end, whatever you're taking the x derivative of, you put a dx at the end, and that tells it to take an integral, but then you go from whatever to whatever, and that tends to work for me. Okay, and this just integral and not do that. Yeah. What's this? To have Wolfram evaluate your definite integral and give you a number? Oh yeah, you do have to. You, you, there, there's a few different formats to use for that. Now I'm actually curious if you can ask Wolfram how to type in an integral. <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna check that out right now. Uh, All right, so I want you to find y prime, and then y prime squared plus one. So take derivative first. This derivative won't be so easy. I mean, it's easy to compute, but then squaring it's going to be a bit of a pain. So this is where clever algebra is going to come into play. So your y prime is easy to find, relatively easy to find. How do you anti? Or how do you differentiate one over x? It's not natural log. Could go quotient rule, that's the scenic route. Right as x to negative first power, 
and then just do the uh, power, the standard power rule. The antiderivative one over x is natural log, but not the derivative. So Wolfram wouldn't tell me directly, but I did click on the examples button. And of course, I want the math examples. And someone here's calculus. Here we go, computed definite integral, two clicks. So it's this one on the left column here. Integrate your function from to Yeah, there are other ways to type it in, but that's that's a way to type it in. Hey, look, compute area between. So just to warn you, Wolfram is very powerful. So it can allow you to completely avoid learning any calculus while doing your homework. You don't want to use it as uh, like that. Well, you shouldn't want to. Any questions on Y prime? So I'm going to FOIL the first term, x to the fourth over 4 squared minus, now the inside outside terms, the x squared cancels the x squared, and we get minus a fourth. But we get two of these terms, so it's going to be minus two of those guys. And last up, I'm squaring the last term, which is plus 1 over x to the fourth. Do we have to do a plus 1 at the end? Oh, yeah, absolutely. That's the outside inside terms, so there's two of them because you're squaring. So all I'm using is the, what I wrote before, a plus b squared. Like that. Well, technically there's a minus in between, but that only changes the middle term to be negative, but still negative 2. So that's where that 2 came from.
So what is the difference between the two? Oh, I didn't really do a good job of circling the second one. What's the real difference between the first uh, expression that I circled and the second one? I wrote it in a slightly different form, but what's really the difference? What's that? So one half went from negative to positive. So let's think about factoring. A minus B squared, you've seen this before, that's some algebra one stuff right there probably, maybe barely algebra two. If I change this to a plus, it still works, the factoring. So we went from what we started with to the same thing with a plus right there. So it's gonna refactor as x squared over four minus one over x squared, plus one over x squared squared. So it's gonna refactor almost the same way. Good news is when we plug this in, this is gonna be inside the square root, which is gonna cancel that square perfectly. So our volume, or volume length, integral a, b, y prime squared plus one, dx. So I'm using this, this is y prime squared, and I'm using that expression. Oh, it's y prime squared plus one. And our x values came in a weird form. So we went from a point to another point. What do I use out of these points? So I got x values. I'm going from an x value to another x value. So I'm going to go 1 to 4. And from here, that's just anti-power rule on each term. So add one to the, well, you rewrite one over x squared as x to the negative two, and just use the anti-power rule on both terms. So we have a little more to get through for arc length, but you can probably do most of your homeworks from the arc length section right now with, with what we've done so far.